Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming, uh, despite the weather. Uh, I think uh, I appreciate the attendance. I just talked with you, you know, I was a little bit worried about attendance. So thank you for making it. And you know, before Charles, I guess to introduce you, know, I want to introduce our icon center series, um, one of the organizers uh, for the series, uh, Professor Leon Wong from Civil Engineering. I'm um, organizing I icon center series with uh, my colleague, Professor Patrick Moon from UC and Professor Tolle from uh, Polytech. Uh, so this semester, uh, we also have a wonderful line of starting with Yuji Neo, uh, but a wonderful line of speakers. Uh, we have um, having that right now, and which speakers will uh, send that out uh, next week. Uh, speakers from Northwestern, Georgia Tech, uh, Wash U, uh, USC, UPenn, Arizona State, MIT, UCLA, uh, and uh, Illinois. And more importantly, we also have a distinguished talk uh, from a member of NAE uh, from USC, and also from uh, a, an industry talk from a factory manager from Google, the leading company. So uh, very exciting. And uh, with that, I will probably pass it to our co-director of ICOM, Shaw Kai to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to attend the ICOM seminar. Before introducing Eugenia, who is my very good friend, I yeah. also want to thank our seminar organizer. And also, uh, ICOM is a platform and uh, aiming to be part of our mission, which is directed by Kelsey and myself. And we got uh, a lot of support uh, from uh, uh, our very nice colleagues, especially Dr. Wen Chen for the past few years for us to maintain uh, this very nice uh, panel. And this semester, as I mentioned, that we will have a series of seminars, uh, including one major part is the joint event between iPi and uh, And so our first speaker is uh, Eugenia. Uh, whom I have known for a long time, actually. And uh, Eugenia is a, a professor in the subject head and uh, Purdue BME, and also served as an interim director for IPI and for Institute for Physical AI. And uh, Eugenia has uh, received uh, many prestigious awards, including TIGA, and also a distinguished, uh, actually distinguished uh, seminar. And also, his uh, research interest include the uh, mixed model of integrated circuits, a bio into uh, mutation and also AI too. So today we would like uh, very much to hear about your thoughts, your research, your opinion about the AI, AI application, and of the AI and uh, their So Welcome. Yes. Hey, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm also representing uh, IPI, uh, the Institute of Physical AI. Um, and I'll say a few words uh, maybe at the end of the talk. Yeah. Um, Share this. Share this. Yes. Um, let's see. Maybe that's that's what it is. It's sometimes coming and going. No. Okay. Um, let's see, what did I do? Okay. Let me know if there's any problem. We can we can fix it. <clears throat> um, so first, I wanted to yeah. Well, maybe I should move this thing here a little bit. Uh, I should tell you a little bit about uh, our experience. Uh, so, like twenty five years uh, of experience we have on um, on AI and neural networks. So, so I I started many many years ago as a graduate student, and I was uh, making. Um, neural network on a microchip. Uh, so artificial uh, neural transceivers and uh, and then um, uh, image sensors. Um, so this is the beginning when uh, CMOS uh, cameras were starting to come out. Uh, and we were making uh, uh, cameras that were looking like the human eye. <clears throat> I apologize, it's coming and going sometimes. Um, then, um, at some point, uh, I got interested in uh, trying to figure out, okay, well, um, how do we figure out what's in the picture? So we were able to take pictures. Yeah, I don't, it's really strange. <laughs> uh, maybe the cable or maybe my- This is a cable sometimes. You think so? Yeah, oh, no. okay. Oh, yeah. Is it still sharing? Yeah. Yes. Share. Desktop, okay. Oh. 
<clears throat> yes. Uh, okay. So yeah, I was saying um, we were designing. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to try to plug this in? Maybe let's see if this works. Maybe this thing helps or something. Or or you want to switch? <clears throat> Sometimes it's just that. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, so, yeah, so we were designing cameras uh, based on how the brain, you know, how our human eyes uh, work. And then at some point we got interested and tried to figure out, okay, what, what's in the pictures? Um, and so we started designing um, algorithm on a chip to 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 try to figure out uh, you know object categorization and this was like early days before uh, neural networks were very popular. Then, in two thousand and eight, uh, I met uh, Jan Lecun at uh, NYU, uh, and then we started collaborating. So we said, okay, a neural network seems to be pretty interesting, and uh, we should make some some hardware for it. And so together we collaborated and we made the five generation of uh, neural processor uh, over the years. And uh, the, the last one, um, we had a startup here from Purdue and, um, um, and we were able to sell it to Micron and then Micron was supposed to build a new AI hardware. And then the problem is all these uh, big companies like Intel and uh, AMD and anyone by the NVIDIA basically are cannot get their act together. So somehow uh, they can't manage to to put up a team to to make a new new custom hardware. And it's a particularly a problem because you'll see it because we have a really a huge shortage of AI hardware and a big need of improved uh, performance. Anyway, um, while we were working on hardware, we developed a lot of software. So for example, our team was uh, uh, we develop, we co-developed Torch 7 with the group from Jan LeCun. And Torch 7 is what uh, now became PyTorch. Uh, and at the time, there was nothing. So the first time I was learning neural network from Jan, like he gave me some kind of a Lisp derivative and I couldn't understand anything. And I said, you know, can can you write this thing in C or something that we engineers can understand? <laughs> Um, and um, and then um, the guys that uh, decided to run Torch and Torch was uh, in at the time Lua, which was a, a language uh, used in video games, uh, like a scripting language. It was very similar to Python. And I told them, look, you guys, you need to do it in Python because Python is going to explode. And they didn't listen. So for a while, uh, Torch was like uh, based on Lua. And then at some point in 2016 or so, they decided to make it into Python and uh, this was at the time when uh, TensorFlow uh, started to pick up. Anyway, long story. I've been I've been through all that, so I just wanted to let you know. <clears throat> but yeah, today um, I wanted to tell you a little bit something else. So, so I wanted to think about uh, where are we going with AI. Uh, in particular, I see. So one of the big goals of of at least my career was to try to replicate. Uh, the human brain in hardware or software um, and the human brain okay we all have it so we know what it is yeah. but it's it's a remarkable uh, piece of hardware really um, that evolved probably in the last uh, hundred thousand years or so more than more than before but evolved over a long time uh, to accomplish lots of uh, interesting tasks um, which we're all familiar with because we have one right <laughs> And there are some things that the brain can do very well, um, like drive your car. And there are some things that uh, that we can't do very well, like uh, matrix multiply in your head, right? Um, and um, but uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at AI, uh, what it is is basically trying to uh, to copy the human brain because it's probably the best example in the known universe of uh, advanced computing, right? <clears throat> So uh, it turns out, um, you know, the brain has been studied and continues to be studied in neuroscience and uh, and, and other, other discipline. And uh, every every time somebody wants to mimic the brain, they start uh, putting up a bunch of diagrams like this one. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so these are some neuroscience diagram. This is like the human visual system, for example. Um, the interesting thing about all this is like everyone has a theory, everybody puts up a diagram. And then when we were trying to build neural networks to, you know, at the beginning it was, uh, we were building face detectors or object detectors, right? And I was going everywhere and I was telling you, okay, can you explain to me this diagram? Because I need to build a network. I have PyTorch, I have a component. I just need to know, you know, what are the convolution filter, how many layers, and nobody had an, any idea. So basically all of these diagrams were of, of very little use uh, up to today's, you know, building up um, the AI that you see today. So that's, uh, that's a little strange. <clears throat> but, um, as an example of, of application, of course, uh, um, maybe the, the biggest one is, uh, is autonomous cars. Um, then um, uh, if you think about how to build an autonomous car, you have to, and it's, it's really like, um, you, you don't think of it that way, but it's really a robot, right? So the autonomous car has to basically sense the environment, uh, and then it has to, to control accelerator and steering angle. So, you know, in the simplest case, it's just a couple of degrees of freedom, not very, not very hard. Um, but he has to make sense of the world, recognize things. Um, uh, AI for autonomous cars started a long time ago, like 60 years ago in the summer at MIT, uh, they put together a bunch of undergrads and they say, well, you know, this summer we should be able to figure out and replicate uh, computer vision uh, in an algorithm, uh, you know, and boy, they were wrong, right? Um, also, if you think a few years back, just the five, six years back, um, I was always telling my son, uh, oh, you probably don't need to learn how to drive because we'll have autonomous cars. Uh, and I was totally wrong too, right? Uh, I think what we, what we forgot at the time is um, and maybe we were too optimistic because uh, at the time you started having this neural network started to work, uh, they started to segment uh, images. We did a few here at Purdue. Uh, they were even used by Tesla, by the way. Um, and, um, and, you know, we were a little bit cocky and we thought, okay, this is going to be easy. Um, and in reality, what is really missing and the difficult part is uh, how you really understand the, the world, right? Uh, so I'm going to try to say something about that, I hope. <clears throat> So before I begin, I want to tell you something that probably many of you already know this, but I think it's a good context. So uh, I'm going to start very, very easy. Um, um, I think in the last uh, 10 years, uh, oh. okay, no problem. Um, yeah, you might want to create a neural network based uh, that decides uh, whether something is a fruit uh, based, based on some characteristics, input characteristics, right? Um, and um, so this characteristic could be green, the size is 0.1 meters, uh, round shape, and uh, has a certain fir firmness, right? And then, okay, maybe that's uh, likely to be an apple, right? And I can train a neural network by showing a bunch of these examples, a bunch of numbers, inputs, and then outputs, inputs and outputs, right? Like this. Um, and by the way, uh, if I have a category like green, multiple colors, I have to turn it into a number, otherwise the neural network doesn't understand it. So I have to make it into a, vec a vector of categories, right? And maybe do a one out encoding. Anyway, you all seen this. Um, uh, then we started trying to do um, things like this. So, so uh, here I'm making a very rough approximation, but imagine that uh, I'm, I'm inputting um, a sentence now to a neural network, right? Um, and then I'm trying to figure out, for example, is this sentence a positive sentence or 
what is the negative sentence, right? So one is, uh, uh, I like big networks, and the other sentence could be, terrible the day was. Right, like, are these sentences positive or negative? And uh, here, the interesting thing is that um, if you have to look at the position of, of the words and the weights, so a traditional, you know, neural network 1.0, uh, the simplest kind, right? Um, they have a hard time doing a task like this on something like a sentence. Uh, because, for example, um, here you would figure out that this sentence is positive because of the second item, right? There's a there's a like word and like is supposed to be positive. Um, in this other case, though, it's the first the first uh, input that that, uh, that tells you whether it was positive or negative, in this case, negative. So as you can see in this network, uh, the weights in a fixed position, basically, that's really the problem. And the weights are in a fixed position and uh, and they have to uh, try to identify all these possible combination in a sentence because a sentence like this, I could move terrible in many different places, right? Uh, the day was terrible or terrible the day was, or or uh, the, these days, uh, you know, terrible it was. Or you can say it in many different ways and we all understand. Uh, but the position of the word that is most important that you need to focus on is changing all the time. <clears throat> so this becomes a little bit more complicated. So if you have a more complicated sentence like, uh, my dog did not eat the apple because it was sour, right? Um, if at a certain point I ask you, I ask a neural network to figure out what does the word eat refer to, right? Is it the dog or the apple? Um, and then it becomes a little bit more complicated because uh, the position of this word can change so much. <clears throat> so it, it turns out that in in 2017 or so, uh, people were, well, 2015, 17, people were trying to solve this problem. And then maybe serendipitously, um, they found out that well, you know, it cannot really be solved with the, with the static neural network 1.0. So they invented neural network 2.0. I think that was kind of a big, a big change, 2017. Um, and what they figured out is that they could introduce uh, uh, two more layer, one more layer in the middle. They could introduce some transformation, some matrix transformation that basically could rearrange the item in a sentence, right? Uh, and that was a big deal. Uh, of course, you could do it here too. Uh, for example, you could have in parallel so many neural network each for for different sentences, but the, the number of combination becomes enormous, right? With the number of position and words possible. Um, so it turns out that uh, something like this helps. Uh, just uh, trying to you have to think of it as I'm trying to rearrange the uh, the position of the word so that I have the right weight, positive or negative, always in the same place, and I can and then I can solve this problem. Um, well, it turns out that so this is done. Uh, this is actually um, an an attention layer in neural network. Um, but if you think of attention, what does attention attention means, right? If I go back one second, uh, the attention is nothing but a weight. So if I have to try to to say if this uh, sentence is positive or negative, all I need is a weight in the right place, right? That tells me, oh yeah, we focus on that word because the other word don't matter for this task at least. Um, so here is the same thing, right? Um, all I do is I have two layers, so two matrices that can basically rearrange all the inputs. Uh, and then I can solve this problem. Um, and this was uh, the main the main idea behind uh, uh, neural attention. This is like uh, an attention head. I'm just this is just a different version of the same diagram. So I have an input like a three words. Uh, I have the matrices, I'm rearranging them. And then uh, out of these matrices, I create a, a, a set of weights to weight the um, 
the actual words themselves. And these weights are input dependent. That's like a big, that is a big uh, change that happened in 2017. A lot of people maybe don't realize this, uh, but this was uh, in the paper, attention is all you need from Google. And uh, that's what started all the GPT revolution, LLM revolution. It's just this simple thing. Um, and I wonder, so now I have a question for neuroscience colleagues as I, I'm trying to ask them, okay, well, is this in the brain anywhere? Because nobody really knows. Um, it might be interesting to find out at some point. Um, so this, uh, what I showed you is, is basically ends up being inside the transformer. The transformer is this neural network that powers all the ChatGPT and this uh, large language model. Um, and then um, it's inside here. Um, it's a layer that basically reshuffles and rearranges the sequence of inputs. It doesn't have to be sentence, could be something else. In fact, this network now are used to do vision too. So they replaced, uh, they're much better performing, you know, than CNN, like convolutional network. Um, and uh, they're basically, they became the one, one algorithm to rule them all, <laughs> which is actually what we wanted. So in, in the neural network and machine learning community, what we wanted is we wanted to find one neural network that could solve all the problems. Because the whole point of all this field is I want to write a, one prog program and it's the last program I'm ever going to write because everything else will come from it. Um, if you think of it, you'll see a parallel with what we can do with ChatGPT maybe or, or things like that. Um, but this is the network that came out uh, from all of this. And it works because of what I just told you. It, it's as simple as that. The rest of the network is actually not that complicated if you go and look at it. Um, so then of course, because of the transformer, uh, uh, after a couple of years, uh, um, GPT or GPT came out, these large language models. Uh, they're actually exactly like the transformer. There's very little change. The only like big, uh, innovation, engineering innovation, is that uh, they figure out how to scale a data center uh, to train on uh, a trizillions of, of sentences. So so um, the last the GPT-4, for example, was trained on uh, the majority of the internet content. So it's actually, if you were to read every single day of your life for 24 hours straight, you couldn't even read one tenth of what ChatGPT writes, okay, when it was trained. So it's, it's an enormous amount. Uh, it's 10 to the 25 flops just to train it. And it costs the tens of millions of dollars. Um, so now you see the problem. Uh, first of all, it's too expensive to train. Second of all, who the heck has that kind of money to buy? Meta just, uh, I don't know if you saw the news, but... Meta yesterday said that they would buy uh, 300,000 <laughs> GPUs for some billion dollar. Um, <laughs> here, you know, we went and talked to the president. We say, hey, we probably need a few more GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking 30 million and it's already like a big deal. Um, and uh, so the problem is shortage of hardware. It's only NVIDIA building this thing, optimized. Um, everybody wants to have them, especially the big companies. They're terribly efficient still. Uh, we need to we need to improve efficiency a hundred times, not ten times, hundred times, in order to be able to you know put them on your phone and things like that. So we got a lot of work to do. Unfortunately, I think there's no hope for uh, for Moore's law here. Basically. It's not gonna happen on the current microchips, I think. We're gonna have to find something else. And I think probably Moore's law, okay, we got all the semiconductors happening here, but I'm afraid that the Moore's law had uh, too much success. So much success that um, it didn't let other things happen. And uh, now we're in, we're in trouble. Um, of course, we don't need a better cell phone. You know, the cell phone, from, we don't need advanced technology most of the time. <laughs> 
I mean, we don't need to go to the five nanometer, seven nanometer. You know, if we have 45 nanometer, we're still okay. We can drive a car, we can get some cell phones. Um, but for AI, you do need it, yeah. So uh, the question is, okay, now we got this chat GPT. Um, are we some somewhere there? Where are we with this comparison hardware and uh, and brains? And uh, so I asked the Bard. So this is like another LLM from Google, right? I asked Bard. They said, "What do you think is the origin of life, and how was uh, our universe created?" I, I, you guys have played these experiments on your own, right? But uh, it's pretty amazing what he says. Um, so remember, how were these things trained, this large language model? So at the end of the day, they were trained in the simplest possible way. Uh, no, nobody can possibly label the entire internet, right? So what they what they did is they um, they just use the simplest algorithm. So you get a few words and predict the next word, right? Uh, that's that's basically it. Honestly, it's very simple. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, there's always been a theory in neuroscience that uh, that's how our, our brain works. So that our brain is constantly predicting. And uh, when it cannot predict, when it can predict, it usually ignores. So, for example, you probably don't remember how you drove here this morning. Like, you don't remember exactly, you know, what kind of gear you shifted or radio or, like, all the details. Because uh, that's kind of automatic and you don't need to know. But you probably... Uh, remember something that didn't happen before like okay well there was too much snow right so the the surprise is actually a signal of the brain to say hey you need to pay attention to this you need to learn it um in any case just to by um training it to predict the next word then it can create uh, pretty impressive impressive things and all of us have tried this but we need to go a little bit deeper for a second. Uh, so for example, the other interesting thing is that it's very similarly, because it can predict the next word, it can learn to code because you can feed him code, right? Not only can code, but you can also tell, give him a broken code and you can tell him to fix it. And, you can, and it's not just one file, you can generate multiple files now. So you can generate an entire program. I actually tell the students now that um, you know, try to use this as much as possible if you can. Uh, the only because nobody wants to program computers, right? But there's a big difference. There's a big problem there. So first of all, um, computer code is designed to be very precise for a reason because you're actually specifying everything. You know, put this pixel right there and da da da, and uh, and doing this in in language, it's pretty verbose. So sometimes it takes you even more than writing code. Uh, and also, if you have your computer uh, bar the right code for you, every now and then uh, you'll throw in some some mistake, and then you have to debug. So your debugging skill have to be pretty good. So it turns out you still need to program for a while. We'll see. <clears throat> so then the interesting thing is that. Um, ChatGPT and so forth, they were trained on text, just on text, but the world is not just text. In fact, text is only a label that we assign to reality to talk to each other, really. Um, reality itself is multimodal, uh, multimodal experiences. So now most, a lot of the models are just starting to get multimodal. So you can ask him question about what's strange about this, and he will tell you, well, you know, elephants are not naturally suited to ride, riding scooter. So it has a pretty impressive capabilities, even though it has never seen this, this image, never li lived in the real world, it's saying the right things. Uh, so you have to think about that a little bit because it means that it has a pretty good understanding about this image too, and, and the relationship with, with text. And text is a description of reality. So it has a pretty good description of the world, even though it doesn't have eyes. <clears throat> it, it gets better. So I would I was trying to figure out, okay, how much of this model really understand the physical world? Uh, so 
the BART, for example, cannot uh, cannot draw, right? There are, but there are these other software like Dali that can they can draw. Uh, by the way, I I really don't like Dali because the uh, or this system because they basically work by re, um, removing noise from an image or turning noise into an image, which I it's totally the wrong way to do things, because when we draw things, we draw lines and things. So I I told him, you know, can you can you write the uh, vector graphics for a car, and people have done similar experiment, but it actually it can draw. A, he can draw a car and sometimes, maybe not in this example, sometimes he can put the wheels in the right place, he put the bumpers here. So so he wrote this code and then I put it in SVG and he generated an image. So he actually knows a lot about reality. Yeah, you can tell him to do, people have done an example with, uh, to, to, to draw a horse and he puts the tail in the right place, the legs in the right place, the head. So actually, he knows quite a bit about uh, how things are supposed to be, which is surprising, even just from text. Um, another thing that people have have done with uh, with this model is that uh, they try to figure out uh, well, did they how much did they really learn about logic or like uh, understanding sentences, right? Because they can spit up sentences, but do they understand it? So one of the tests. Uh, for this is the Vinogra scheme. So you have a sentence like that. The city councilman refused the demonstrator a permit because they feared violence, right? And then you ask the model who feared violence. And for us, well, most of us, we can kind of figure out, okay, it should be the councilman. <clears throat> it turns out that before GPT-4, uh, GPT-3 could, could not really solve this problem. But because the GPT-4 was trained on even larger amount of data, then now it's actually able to solve it. I forgot it was like 50 or 70% of the time. Not, not always, but, um, and this happens because as you train this model, people have noticed that basically you see a sudden jump in performance. So, so all of a sudden they cannot do some task like this, but after you train them for a while, all of a sudden they learn and then they can do it. And it has to do with the scale, uh, just the scale of, of data, apparently. So I asked the bar to do this and he actually knows. Mm -hmm. So another interesting thing is um, multiplications, right? So, so if I ask you to multiply a number, you guys kind of remember from, from elementary school how to do it, right? Well, especially now that we have kids and we have to teach them. And uh, so it turns out that if you ask GPT-4 to do multiplication, you know, what is the result of 25 by 43, right? If it's uh, two digits, it's 99% correct. So you can do almost most of them. But if three digit or four digit, then it starts to go down. Uh, and people were like wondering why, why is that? Well, it's a kind of obvious. It's just that, there's lots of example of two by two, you know two digit multiplication in text. In fact, there's probably all of them. So he learned it. But um, but in in the internet text, you probably don't have all possible combinations. So you start to go down. Actually, this exactly is is the same for us. We remember the table of multiplication for for some numbers where we remember them, but uh, three num three digits well, we just don't don't know, right? Why? Because uh, we just didn't build a table. Um, remember, these things are trained to predict the next word. If they had an example like this, then they can learn it. But so, um, so let's look at the transformer again and try to figure out, okay, why is it, is it not learning something like this, right? Um, so actually what the transformer is doing is, uh, it generates a giant uh, uh, knowledge graph, okay? So it takes all the words of all the inputs that you give it, and it just creates this graph connecting all sorts of things. So for example, um, you could you could connect uh, the word Egyptian with the word cat and the word man, because all of these words are somehow related to cat and cat like Egyptian, there's a man cat, right? 
so it connects those three words together. They kind of sort of group more together. Um, and that's a way, that's how he figures out how to talk and do all these things. Um, they create this giant knowledge graph. <clears throat> and unfortunately, in the case of uh, multiple digits numbers, right, or two digit numbers or three digits numbers, there's just not enough examples. So it just uh, didn't encode all these possibilities. So it cannot do it. I think it's, uh, it's fairly obvious. The interesting thing is you can tell him, can you write me code to multiply three or four, for any number, any digit number, and it will write you the code and it's right. So he can do it exactly like we do. He has the algorithm, he learned the algorithm and he can solve any, any multiplication. It's not solving by recalling it, it's solving by generating the program and running it. So it's like almost a clone of us in, in a way. Uh, then we get to, to the interesting things, robot, robotics. So, so how do you go from this LLM that live in the cloud to finally giving us a robot that can cook for us or something in more interesting, right? Um, so actually, uh, lots of work recently in the last couple of years by Google, Amazon, especially Google doing enormous amount of work. So they took this LLM and they used the uh, LLM to uh, basically plan the task. But the LLM doesn't know anything about the physical world because it's not a multimodal LLM. And so uh, the problem is it just doesn't know how to, to grab things or move. But if you, if you give him a picture of this room and tell him, how do I get coffee from here? He will tell you, well, you go down that way and, and left and then, so he can plan for you. Amazingly, even though he hasn't seen that many picture. Uh, but then when you have to control your legs or control your arms, it doesn't know why, because well, we just, there's no, it, LLM were not trained with that data, right? In fact, I don't think anywhere in the, in the written literature, there's anywhere, <laughs> Um, a precise uh, set of coordinate of how you grasp a ball, for example. I don't think there is. So that's why they don't know. Um, but so today, people use transformer connected to a bunch of tools like search engine, uh, calculate external tools so that they can do things uh, in a loop. Uh, so there's paper, there's a famous paper recently called the, the CAMCRO. They can do synthesize entire uh, chemical new mo new chemical mo molecules, and the way it's, it's doing it, you tell him design this molecule, and he basically goes and uh, figures out what the possible next action is. He runs a simulator, and, and he checks, and then he keeps going like this. It's kind of like a mini artificial scientist, if you will. So it's very interesting, um, and um, in, for us, we understand that. Um, um, the future of transformer or the future of this LLM for us is really going multimodal. Uh, so we basically have to train them to, to see, to perceive, and to be embodied. If you want to use them in a robot, you probably will have to start from scratch, unfortunately, because uh, um, the robot he needs to experience with his own body, with his own sensor. Uh, all the possible experiences, you know, the words are not are just not enough. And in fact, this is what what is happening at Google a little bit, and we're trying to do a bit of that here. Um, so if you do this, can you build the common sense? So I think so, because um, as you as you build this knowledge graph in in words, right, uh, with LLM, they can connect a different kind of concept, very different. They can connect them together. Um, but what is really common sense? Common sense is just uh, um, it's the co-occurrence co of events, right? Uh, things that happen together, they're learned together. And this is what uh, builds a common sense, right? So for example, you know, I've never seen an elephant uh, running on the sky. Right, so never seen that. So never co-occurs. 
I never learn it. So I kind of know that that doesn't happen, right? Um, the other interesting thing that I think uh, we need to think about is uh, when you train this model, a lot of these models are still very much fit forward. What is the possible source of feedback? What is the what is that makes them uh, pay attention more to one input than more to the other? Some of it is the training itself because during training you have back propagation, um, but uh, there's a little bit more, which I'll I'll tell you in a sec. <clears throat> Um, the other interesting thing, application and uh, sort of future of uh, machine learning and neural net and in this LLM is that, uh, believe it or not, so this is actually the transformer paper. So I took a page of it. Uh, believe it or not, we don't have any neural network that can look at that guy diagram and understand it. So you can ask a question about this diagram, you know, what is the uh, what is the multi-headed attention uh, followed by? Can read it, right? So it's another reason why we need the multimodal system. And it's not just for the real world, but it's also in the document. Even even just a web page, or even just a page with text. If you look at the first page of an article, it has a title, and it has an abstract, and they're all in different positions, right? And if you try to do OCR on on this document, they all get grumbled together, right? But uh, but for us, the position, you know, the, we know that the, the title is there, that is a title, it has a, some some meaning, the abstract has another meaning. Uh, there's a, If there's a text under a figure, it's a caption. So there's like all these spatial arrangement, uh, they're lost now when you train LLMs. Um, but we need to get them back. And the only way to get them back is we need to have LLM that can read just like us. So instead of using um, OCR, they need to scan the, this thing as an image and make sense of it. So lots of people developing these tools right now and it's gonna come up. Um, and this is a big deal because we got a lot of the documents like this, like hum human readable documents. Uh, with tables and other things, and uh, and right now we cannot really mine them yet. <clears throat> so, how does a multimodal system work, right? So you'll have a combination of some text, you'll have an image, you'll have some some um, table or something else. So all of these things have to be turned into some kind of code, um, and if we can turn them into code, then they can be input to the transformer. And then you need to predict the next thing. But it's easy. So when you have text, you can say, OK, what's the next word? But when you have multimodal data, what is the next thing? That's the part that makes it, makes it difficult right now, right? Um, and so one of the things that you do is, uh, at the end of the day, if you think about it, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to to put all of these different modality, project them into the same embedding spaces, right? So I'm trying to connect them together. Again, it's like a co-occurrence of events or co-occurrence of things. Um, and then once I have that, if I have an embedding of this part of, uh, for example, this uh, action of a robot, then I can predict, okay, what, what's gonna happen next? But it's not as simple as that because uh, um, for robots, for example, um, you think about how we sa we sample time. Uh, we can't sample regularly, just like in text uh, that you have words and spaces. Like in um, in the in real life, there's some things like um, me walking all the way there might take five seconds, but it's not important because the goal was to go from here to there. So all of that should not really be taken into consideration. What should what should be taken in consideration if there's some I have an obstacle all of a sudden in front of me, then I need to wake up. So again, it's like some paying attention to to what is the, what is the sequence. Um, and then of course I have to make my own brain diagram, and so it's something like this. <laughs> It's very similar to what I was telling you before, but um, if I was to think of a, 
like a ro robotic brain, it would be a diagram sort of like this. So it, it would have a, a way to embed all different modalities into concepts, same concept space. So this is like a co-occurrence learning. And then there's a giant transformer similar to what's in LLM. And, and then uh, this transformer could, uh, could go into the next concept, right? Uh, by the way, I could use some other neural network from the, this concept to generate text or video or audio, uh, which is what we do. We don't generate video as humans, but we generate actions. Um, and then, I, of course, I could generate some actions. So we call this the model mix match <clears throat> for now. But if you look at it, where are all the arrows pointing to? So they're all in the same direction. Instead, the the human brain actually has an enormous amount of feedback. There's more feedback than feed forward. Uh, so some of it, again, some of it you have to think of it is in a neural network is uh, uh, is uh, given during the training process, but some of it is still missing. Um, and these are the things that, uh, so if you take ChatGPT today, for example, right, and you'll have a conversation, right, and then you come back tomorrow, you will, you will have forgotten everything, right? Okay, that's an easy, that's an easy problem to solve because what you could do is you can store all your previous conversation there. So every time you ask him a question, he can go and figure out similarity with the previous conversation and then include your new conversation, the old conversation, and then it's going to look like it remembers you. So that's an easy problem to solve. Um, but with all these LLM compared to humans, they have a big difference. So first of all, um, they don't have different uh, short, uh, different memory hierarchy. Second, um, they, um, so they don't really have goals yet. Right, so it doesn't have his own goals, and it doesn't know who it is. It doesn't have a concept of self, right? And uh, I think, what am I doing? A working memory that it can do now because it can generate some some intermediate plans. But what about the rest? So if you think about if you think about uh, uh, an uh, an idea, the idea of self, right? Is uh, we have this idea of self, uh, we have like, um, and it's based on our previous experiences as humans. I mean, all our history and previous experience sort of defines who we are. And then I think based on all of this experience, um, we sort of uh, try to define our characteristics, right? So if we have a big enough memory and the ability to look at all these past experiences, I think you could make a transformer assume some kind of personality. He can already do that. So if you tell him, for example, you know, you are a lawyer, right? Blah, blah, blah. Then he will write it as a lawyer. And if you tell him, uh, write it as a first year kid, then he will write it as a... So he kind of understand that. But, uh, but I think it's... Uh, what makes it what gives him an idea of self is just the history uh, that's probably all there is but what about goals so right now you know you talk to this uh, these machines but they don't they don't necessarily have a goal but if you think about it um i think goals could be again an evolution of a prediction so as you assume as you define yourself as something, right? I define myself as a good student, for example, right? Now, if I have predicted capabilities into the future, I could, uh, based on what I read, you know, from uh, literature or what I was trained on, I could see that, okay, a good student actually takes his PhD exam and then he writes papers and then... So maybe he already it can already define some goals for itself, right? And it's just another form of prediction. So it turns out that that's quite interesting, I think, if you think of it that way. No, but we'll, we'll have to see if this happens. Um, and then I think the other interesting thing that is, that is starting to happen is that this multimodal uh, large language model 
they'll be able to consume of the body of knowledge in a certain field and become a bit like a science assistant, if you will. And you'll be able to ask them questions. You'll be able to tell them, you know, run this experiment, get the result and check all the possible combinations. They'll be able to synthesize uh, molecules or drugs. Uh, it's already happening to some extent, but you'll see more of this is happening, I think, in the near future. Um, and then to conclude, I wanted to tell you some a few take-home messages. Uh, well, first of all, new, neural networks. So, you know, when you talk about machine learning, there's all different techniques, but it's uh, today it's just neural networks, really. But neural networks are still surprising us. Um, and that was our choice, which we chose to mimic the human brain. Um, prediction as a learning technique is going a long way. Uh, maybe prediction is all you need, right? Um, maybe you can do everything that, that we know. Maybe there's a reinforce, reinforcement learning plays a very minimal role. Or a, um, we still, I still don't know what is the feedback from high order function. So that means, so let's say that I uh, develop a high order function, for example, uh, you know, I learned to drive a car, right? But um, I'm going to have to feedback my knowledge all the way to the sensor processing because um, um, the sensor are actually the, the one that detect important things in the world, right? And right now we're not really doing that. Right now we're taking a pre-trained sensor and we're patching them together and there's no mechanism to keep training them. Uh, so think of it, Think of it as a, you know, um, as you learn to to do a, a complicated task like play the piano or like well, maybe, maybe not play the piano, but build something very sophisticated and small like a little craft, right? You you're learning the skills, but you're also improving your vision at the same time, because uh, sometimes you need to notice things that you didn't notice. That's how doctors can tell. If you have cancer from an image or not, I mean they have the same vision as you, but they can see things that you didn't you didn't pay attention. Uh, so we don't know how to go from this eye order back to the input, I think. And then uh, multimodal is definitely the only way to progress. So you'll see that all this large foundational AI model will be multimodal. Unfortunately, we still have no clue on what the brain diagram is and uh, leave it at that. Thank you for, for your time. That is a very, very inspiring, also very intuitive talk. So now we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I wanted to get your thoughts, but on where these things go. So this very interesting observation that when we ask that to compete and multiply the numbers, it doesn't know what the multiplication is primarily going to be. So you could imagine similar things with text, for example, right? So you ask that to be said text, but I was looking for all the games that have a yes. in the other learning text. So do you so, yeah. see essentially the fact being that we train this universal neural network that eventually learns to play text and then calculate the same? You know, um, spoken everything, or could it be specialized neural networks that are all with the other? No, no, yeah, that's a good question. So, yes, yeah, I feel like, okay, yeah, I think, I think that's that's how that was our problem. It's like, you know, why didn't we get autonomous cars? It's because we tried to do all these things in isolation, and even in robotics, it's always. People do this thing in isolation. They'll train a neural network to grasp something. They'll train a neural network to look, to move, locomote, or they'll train a neural network to do. But then uh, when you try to put them together, it looks, it doesn't work, right? So I feel like, you no, know, we, we cannot go that route. I think we'll have to learn everything all at once, like the movie. <laughs> and uh, um, it's, it's actually, that's actually, uh, why why you think robotics is, was a little bit stuck for a while and now i think it seems to be moving but it's still still very complicated because number one you need to be embodied 
and then you need to do things with your own body but um where do you get the training data so somebody has to either teleoperate you or or, uh, or you'll have to show you know humans doing the same task and transfer to to a robot and those things are still not there still not there yet and also uh, you'll have to train almost as much as gpt right all the many experiences and that's really time consuming if i'm teleoperating a robot you know i might get a hundred example a day this robot costs a fortune so they're probably you know you're getting a thousand example a day you're not getting like a millions and millions right um so i it will be interesting to see how that works out you know do we just need a few example or not the brain is not on the team. I know nothing about the brain. Yeah. Essentially, you know, you, you hear that somebody has higher spatial region. So okay, yes. Brain. And so then it seems like having a neural network that, in some sense, from the genius that's a master of everything. Yep. <clears throat> but there is, so the interesting thing so so the brain is is uh, is made of different parts but actually if you look at it so there's the brain stem which is like uh you know the reptile brain the oldest brain that developed then there's the cortex and then there's the cerebellum so the cortex actually some people say some neuroscientists uh, years back they found out that it's actually the same circuit is repeated everywhere which is exactly like the transformer so there's actually when quite an interesting parallel between multi-headed attention and and these uh, cortical columns uh, and nobody knows this cortical column because it's a hundred of neurons and nobody can really understand like figure out but um, to me it make it's a there's an interesting parallel there and then the cerebellum it's uh no nobody's looking at it <laughs> but it's what what is actually giving us fine motor control right You mentioned about this emergent abilities and the model yeah. does the size of the model increases and also the oh, yes. data that increases. Um so now then when we put into the perspective of the multi network, yes, many neural networks and do you expect the size of the models to become exponentially bigger? And um are we Right now, as you see yep. up in the model, yes. we have a full knowledge of the full internet. Are we some limit of the data already? Um, yeah, uh, that for LLM, definitely they have that problem. So people don't know what they're going to train next because they used all the data. So some people think, oh, we should uh, generate more data with LLM, but I uh, don't know about that. Uh, but in uh, in the multimodal case, I think it's uh, it's easier because we got a lot of videos like YouTube or movies uh, that we can learn from. Um, and uh, but but we haven't done it yet, so that would be that's I think that's uh, why people are moving into multimodal because then they can pack, they can use the data too. So yes. Yes. So Right. Yes. And, but the, the, I think they need to grow. So compared to our brain, I think they, we, we still have, yeah. yeah, we still have room to grow because we have hundreds of trillions of connections in, in the brain and the, these models are starting to get, get there. Right. So there's also interesting parallel, but they're starting to get there, but, uh, but, but only a few people can run this huge things. Right. <laughs> So like here we don't have uh, we can run things like ChatGPT at Purdue and uh, Purdue is already a giant institution, you know. Yeah. So uh, as mentioned, uh, sometimes my my meditation speed is just something that we can get wrong. Yeah. So uh, I was just thinking like uh, once the transformer after the transformer the next prediction step. Yes. Uh, it almost sounds like GPT is like a student giving an exam. He knows the procedure to do the multiplication, but he does not really know how to print. Exactly, yeah. So could it be more kind of um, good approach to when the focus after the transformer 
that since it has the procedure, why not use that procedure and then produce it? Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, that's that's what was that's what is happening now. So yeah, when I was showing this this is that now we have some framework that you can uh, the LLM can use external tools, including it can generate code and run it. Yeah. Yeah, this is like all already already here. We had it for for months actually, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so you said that uh, initially the customer started with sourcing. But now the models have been developed so that they are very different from uh, like Gates. And this yes. is now considered to be an alternate intelligence which has a scale capability which biology could be used as well. So wouldn't it be good to just work on this because we have a scale, we can achieve scale, and we are going back and saying, oh, can we find one on one value with three? Yeah, see. no, no, yeah. Yes, yes, you, you have a good point. Yeah, so. <clears throat> You know, at the end of the day, uh, the the brain evolved. Uh, you know, many thousands of millions of years uh, out of uh, gooey stuff, right? <laughs> it it evolved in the in its own the in its own environment. But uh, our environment, you know, microchips and computers, very different environments. So, yeah, the um, the they they could be. There's a lot of optimization probably that we. We don't know, like including materials and uh, the substrate, the micro, you know, the thing that is actually executing this code we were talking about before, right? Right now it's a silicon and the metals and microfabrication, right? But maybe uh, it's time to move to something else. Um, I mean, for example, it would be wonderful if we could um, if we could grow, artif you know, artificial brain and then somehow connect to them and feed them stuff. I mean, then then it would be easy because we already have them, <laughs> but we don't. Uh, that's impossible right now, right? We cannot uh, grow this thing and maintain it. Uh, they need a whole body because we just don't know how to do it. But maybe in the future we could, uh, you know, artificial brain and then connect it. It'll be your computer, right? Uh, or maybe there's something else. There's a new set of materials that uh, that will make the next computer. I don't know. Uh, we need to look for it because uh, now, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For the next talk, so I have one question regarding like using LLM or deep learning on like bio research. Yes. 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 Yep. Yep. Bio is too complicated. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's a good question. <laughs> I, I I have a debate with other people on campus because uh, it, it's funny, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, a lot of us because we have a brain and we're used to do academia. I think we we think that we can do anything, and uh, my feeling is uh, no, we you know we can't possibly do everything. There are some things like uh, understanding our cell works that is there's so many components, layer scales that it's like beyond our comprehension so but people still try to they want to make a model or an equation um, in fact this is what the neural network is all about so this uh, new, this uh, neural network like JetGPT is basically we're trying to create an equation for something that doesn't have an equation right by learning it um, and um, but the, the, there's so many processes coming into play in you know in real in real life that uh, I feel like maybe we can't always understand it, or we can't always have a theory. So maybe the next theory is a neural network, right? Uh, it's a simulator. I don't know. That's my feeling, but it's just it's just what I think. Yeah. <clears throat> so other than the self driving car, what are the sort of big applications you can you think to be useful to make our world more? Oh yeah, okay. Um, there was a movie with Johnny Depp. Um, what's the name of it? Uh, you might have seen Transcendence. I think that's that's what's gonna happen. If you ask me, you haven't seen it. It's a fun one. Who has seen it? Transcendence. 
Okay, you got something to do this weekend. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the future of AI. No, no, you can just, it just well, I think there is um yeah, this AI uh becomes basically an art arti first an artificial sign, then a real sign, then he runs all the experiments, then he figures everything out, yeah. Even how to use humans uh, or or live with them. No. Maybe I'll follow up follow up on that because I'm a physicist. Uh, yes. So very interested in whether or it seems we are seeing the limit of yes. AI try to figure out or or you know push the knowledge out. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you yes. see it as as something that AI is going to do that humans will be able to do? I think so because so. I think once we once we can train them, yeah. Again, right now they're just trained on text, but if we could train them on uh, physics textbooks, they would be able to do so much more. So, like even recently, they start to to prove some math theorems. Or I think just a couple of days ago, I saw a paper where they um, they create some logic rules, and then he was able to do some ge geometry proof. Uh, that that they were not able to do before. So I feel like a, as soon as they'll be able to read the textbook and uh, and understand, you know, the diag from a diagram to to like real life to equations, so then they'll be able to do science for you automatically, autonomously. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I'll take the opportunity to ask the last question. So. Um... You just mentioned three million uh, GPUs uh, for now, for now. So oh, yeah. Uh, I watched a movie, I mean, a video before by Ilya Sapir about AI. Yeah. You mentioned the future. He expects that probably 89% of our power, and we have experts sitting here who just ask questions, on yeah. our power network, all those resources will be used to support GPUs in the future. Yeah. So we'll eat up a lot of our resources and also cause you know, significant impact on environment. Yes. So where do you think we are heading to in terms of both power network and all this stuff? Yeah, that's what's happening today because um, we invested so much into micro microfabrication technology that we cannot escape it, right? It's like a black hole right now. Uh, and but uh, but you know we're we're faced there's always a limit, right? If it's at some point the uh, physics will have a limit. For example, one very interesting thing is that we're still fixated that we, you know, we have to planarize everything. Everything has to be very straight. We have to put things in the right place. But the brain doesn't do that. It just builds on top of crap over crap, you know. <laughs> uh, and and it's more efficient. So I think we need to find other ways. Yeah, I think it's just. But you know, it'll take a while because people will continue to push out GPUs and try to improve them. But having built some of them, I know that the it's it's getting harder to optimize them. Like you might get uh, four or five x in the current uh, microfabrication technology, but you can get a hundred x. All right, we got. Uh, let's come to the thank you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. No problem.